Welcome to the training for Pediatric Ventilator Associated Events, or PVAE. My name is Emily Witt, and I'm a public health analyst with the NHSN Protocol and Training Team. PVAE is one of the relatively newer NHSN events. NHSN events. It went live in January of 2019. So our objectives for today's presentation are to explain the history and development of PVAE, review PVAE key terms, explain how to select daily minimum values, which are in a very important aspect to correctly identifying PVAEs, describe and provide examples of the PVAE surveillance algorithm in action, and finally, to demonstrate use of the PVAE calculator. So as we all know, ventilated patients are at a higher risk for complications and adverse outcomes, and these complications can lead to longer duration on mechanical ventilation, increase their hospital or ICU stay, and also increase their risk for morbidity and mortality. In preterm neonates, we know that prolonged ventilation for respiratory therapy or respiratory distress syndrome can contribute to the development of chronic lung disease, and then prolonged ventilation in the extremely low birth weight infants is also associated with neurodevelopmental delay. So these are all very serious adverse outcomes. In 2012, there is a neonatal and pediatric surveillance working group organized um, composed of representatives both inside and outside of CDC who have an interest and specialty in neonatal and pediatrics. And the purpose of this working group was to look at whether the VAE algorithm which at this point had actually not even been rolled out as an NHSN event yet, it was just in development, if that algorithm would be an option for the pediatric and neonatal population. And from those initial meetings of the working group, it was determined that there was insufficient data uh, to use that, P that VAE um, like definition in these populations. The working group felt that they needed more information before they can move on um, using a, a definition similar to VAE for the pediatric and neonatal population. And this additional information came in a publication um, from Critical Care Medicine in 2016. The publication showed that using a pediatric VAE-like definition, uh, events that are defined by changes in FiO2 and mean airway pressure or MAP could be detected. And these events were associated with an increase in length of stay and with mortality in those pediatric and neonatal populations. So given the information from that 2016 publication, the working group decided to move ahead in developing the pediatric VAE protocol for NHSN. NHSN piloted and build tested this PBA protocol in 2017. And then as I mentioned before, the event became available for use in 2019. You can see a screenshot here of the PBA protocol in its current uh, 2022 iteration. So now that you have some of the background for the development of PVAE, um, let's look at some important information to have before you begin surveillance for these events. So first things first, where can you find all the information about PVAE surveillance? If you go to the NHSN homepage, um, which is linked on this slide, you will see the option to select web pages for acute care, long-term acute care, and inpatient rehab facilities. Um, from there, so for example, in this screenshot, we've selected the acute care critical access hospital link. Uh, so on the link for each of these facilities, you'll then see the PVAE option available um, as shown in this example and indicated by the red arrow. And that option will, from each of these uh, facility type pages, will take you to the same uh, PVAE page, which you can see linked on this slide. Um, so once you select that PBAE page, um, it's going to take you directly here. You'll find all of your PBAE specific resources. This includes your protocol, the PBAE calculator, PBAE training, um, the link to that web page where all the PBAE trainings are posted, PBAE FAQs, and more. This web page will really be your go-to spot for all things uh, PBAE. And then you'll also notice at the top of this page here, uh, we indicate that PBA surveillance is available in plan for both pediatric and neonatal locations for NHSN. Another important first thing to cover is who is eligible for PBA surveillance. Um, and that's going to be your ventilated patients in acute care hospitals, long-term acute care hospitals, and inpatient rehabilitation facilities. And within those facility types, the patients need to be in a pediatric or neonatal location where you can collect denominator data. That's going to be your patient day and ventilator days. 
Adults who may be housed in a pediatric location would also be included in pediatric BAE surveillance. Um, the surveillance is location-based, so like our adult BAE or adult BAE reporting, if you have a child in an adult location, you would still include them in BAE surveillance. Similar, similarly, if you have a pediatric, or excuse me, an adult in a pediatric location, you would include them in your PBAE surveillance for that location. So who is not eligible for PBAE surveillance? That's gonna be um, the patients who are not eligible for PBAE surveillance are those who are on extracorporeal life support or paracorporeal membrane oxygenation. And just as a note, this ineligibility only applies to periods of time um, while patients are receiving this form of support. So if these same patients um, at some point during their stay are on a conventional mode of mechanical ventilation, they would be eligible for PBAE surveillance during those times. And then also excluded from PBAE surveillance are, are your patients in um, non-acute care locations. So what about other specific modes of mechanical ventilation? and a patient's eligibility for surveillance. If a patient is on high-frequency ventilation, APRB or BDR, uh, they are included in PBAE surveillance. Um, I know this is different from adult BAE. Um, they, patients are excluded if they're on high-frequency ventilation. That's not the case for PBAE. Those patients on high-frequency uh, ventilation would be included in surveillance. And then you're also gonna include patients if they are receiving conventional modes of mechanical ventilation and any of these other therapies listed below, the prone positioning, uh, corticosteroids, and so on. Okay, so let's review now the PBAE algorithm. And just um, a little disclaimer here, um, I'm sure you all know, the PBAE algorithm is for use in surveillance. It is not a clinical definition algorithm, and it is not intended for use in the clinical management of patients. So here we have um, a summary of your PBA algorithm. It is short and sweet. It is a single tier. Um, the patient has to be on the ventilator for at least two days, and then you're going to be looking for a baseline period of stability or improvement. And that is going to immediately be followed by sustained a sustained period of worsening oxygenation. Um, and if that is met, you have identified a PBAE. PBAEs are determined by identification of deterioration in the respiratory status after that period of stability or improvement. Um, and you're going to determine that using two parameters listed here, your FiO2 and your mean airway pressure or MAP. And just as a note, this is why you can include those high-frequency ventilation patients in PBAE surveillance, because we're using the MAP parameter um, instead of PEEP. So here's some information about FiO2. Um, it refers to fraction of oxygen and inspired gas. Um, it is a setting on the ventilator and is one of your key parameters that can be adjusted uh, depending on the patient's oxygenation requirements. Uh, here's the definition of MAP. It is a mean airway pressure. It is a mean or average pressure exerted on the airway and lungs from the beginning of inspiration until the beginning of the next inspiration. So it's an inspiratory cycle. And so MAP is um, a little bit different from FiO2. FiO2 is a setting on the ventilator, whereas MAP is a measured or calculated value. Um, it's calculated using PEEP, PIP, inspiratory time, and then other parameters uh, such as flow and frequency. Um, and just a quick note here, in all of our uh, healthcare acronyms, um, MAP for the purposes of PVA surveillance is going to be your mean airway pressure. It's not a mean arterial pressure. So now that we've defined those key terms of FiO2 and MAP, uh, let's talk about their use in PVAE surveillance. The FiO2 ventilator settings and then MAP values are documented across a calendar day for the patients. And we use these values to identify the daily minimum FiO2 and the daily minimum MAP uh, for that calendar day. And then those values are then used to determine uh, your baseline period of stability or improvement and then worsening of oxygenation. Um, and we're gonna go into more detail about, about that later in the presentation. So to determine your daily minimum values, you will compare FiO2 and MAP during the calendar day. Um, but for the period of stability um, or improvement or the worsening to meet PVAE, uh, that is going to be determined by comparing those values from calendar, calendar day to calendar day. Um, and just as a note, when we say calendar day, what we're talking about is 
12 a.m. to 11.59 p.m. So you're to use that as your defined calendar day, not um, you know, a 24 hour period based on charting or any other defined 24 hour, excuse me, 24 hour period. Um, you're just using that calendar day of 12 a.m. to 11.59 p.m. So let's talk in more detail now about the daily minimum FIO2 and MAP. FIO2 settings and MAP readings are typically um, going to be located in your medical record, either in documentation by the respiratory therapist in the flowchart. Um, you might get these uh, values directly from the ventilator, et cetera. Um, wherever you get those values, uh, you are going to use them to choose your daily minimum FIO2 and MAP. So you're going to look at all the documented FIO2 and MAP values across the calendar day while the patient is receiving an eligible mode of mechanical ventilation, and then use those to determine um, what your daily minimum values are for both parameters, both your FIO2 and MAP. This is also going to include periods of time the patient may be undergoing weaning. Um, as long as they are receiving or support from the ventilator, you would use those values that are documented. And um, as we mentioned before, you would exclude FIO2 and MAP values um, if the patient is on um, extracorporeal or paracorporeal membrane oxygenation. So the daily minimum FIO2 is defined as the lowest documented FIO2 setting that was maintained for greater than one hour during the calendar day. In the protocol, and then also briefly um, in the second bullet here, we provide guidance on how you would determine your lowest value if your um, documentation occurs hourly or at more frequent interval, excuse me, intervals. Um, note that NHSN is not recommending or requiring that you document hour by hour or at any specific interval. This guidance just provides a standardized way to determine what um, greater than one hour would be. And then if there um, is no setting that has been maintained for greater than one hour, um, then you're just going to select the lowest setting regardless of the period of time um, that that setting was maintained. So let's take a look at a couple of examples. Um, remembering that you select the lowest values recorded for each calendar day that's maintained for greater than an hour. Um, in this example for Monday, what would the daily minimum FIO2 be? And since this presentation um, is being pre-recorded, I'm going to, um, when I ask some of these knowledge check questions, I will pause um, before I move on to the answer. However, um, if you do want some additional time to work through these, please feel free to pause the presentation here, and I will let you know when I'm moving on to the next slide. So you can, um, you know, pause and then restart once you've determined what your answer is. So for this one, let's move on and see the answer. The correct answer um, for your daily minimum FIO2 is going to be 0.75. Uh, you'll notice that the lowest value is at 3 a.m. and it's actually 0.7, but that's changed by 4 a.m. Uh, with an increase to 0.9. So while the lowest value is 0.7, it was not maintained for greater than an hour. Um, therefore, you're going to look to the next lowest value, which is 0.75, uh, documented on that calendar day and maintained for greater than one hour. So let's look at an example of when ventilation is initiated late in the calendar day. So here we want to determine what your daily minimum FIO2 is for both Monday and Tuesday. And I'm going to move on now to the next slide to see the answer. Okay, so your daily minimum FIO2 for Monday is going to be 0.7 and your daily minimum FIO2 for Tuesday is going to be 0.75. We'll talk a little bit about why that is. On Monday, the patient is started on um, mechanical ventilation at 11 late in the day. They're started at 0.7 and then increased to 0.8 after 30 minutes um, since first being placed on the ventilator. So for Monday, we don't have a value that was maintained for greater than one hour. So in this scenario, you would just simply select the lowest value, which is going to be 0.7. And just as a reminder, when you're doing, when you're making your determination for your daily minimum values, you're looking specifically at each calendar day individually. Um, you're not going to look uh, across to the next calendar day to see if that um, daily minimum FIO2 is maintained. You're looking at each calendar day separately to determine the lowest value. So again, at 12 a.m. to 11.59 p.m. period. So for Tuesday, our daily minimum FIO2 is going to be 0.75. Um, the FI2 is set at 0.75 at 6 o'clock, and at 9 o'clock, it was still 0.75, um, which is definitely greater than an hour, um, so you would select that as your daily minimum FIO2 for Tuesday. 
And let's talk now about um, daily minimum MAP. When you're looking at your daily minimum MAP value, it's just gonna be your lowest MAP value for the day, uh, regardless of how long the value is maintained. So for MAP, unlike FIO2, it does not have to be maintained for greater than an hour. It's just whatever the lowest value is um, recorded. However, um, there are a couple of um, additional pieces of information you need to know when looking at your day, when determining your daily minimum MAP. And one of those is that um, we know that sometimes you can find MAP values that are um, reported to the decimal place. And when that's the case, um, you're going to round up using um, the guidance here. Anything from um, the decimal place 0.00 to 0.49 is going to round down. And then anything from uh, 0.5 to 0.99 is going to round up. So you see in the example, um, anything from 10 to 10.49 would round down to 10. Anything from 10.5 to 10.99 is going to round up to 11. I also want to point out that um, when looking at daily minimum MAP, um, you have to take the patient's age into consideration. If the patient is less than 30 days old, MAP values between 0 and 8 are all going to be considered equal to 8. And then if you have a patient that is 30 days old or older, MAP values 0 to 10 are going to be considered equal to 10. So let's look at an, let's look at an example for identifying the daily minimum MAP. So for this patient, um, we're going to determine the daily minimum MAP for Monday, given the uh, values that have been uh, recorded. Let's take a look at the answer. So remember, this patient is less than 30 days, so the value less than 30 days old. So any values between zero and eight are gonna be equal to eight. So in this case, the lowest value recorded is five, but that would be interpreted to be an eight. So your daily minimum map for Monday would be reported as eight. Let's take a look at an example. Let's take a look at an example when the patient is um, equal to or greater than 30 days old. the answer. Okay, so your daily minimum MAP for Monday um, in this scenario is going to be 10. Keep in mind this patient is um, greater than or equal to 30 days old, so all MAP values between 0 and 10 are going to be equated to 10. So in this case, your daily minimum MAP for Monday, the lowest value is 5, but because the patient is um, greater than or equal to 30 days old, the value would be 10. Your daily minimum MAP would be 10. So now we're going to discuss the application of the algorithm for PBAE surveillance. Here you have a snapshot of the detailed algorithm um, that you can find in the PBAE protocol. Recommend reviewing that in detail. And let's discuss meeting PBAE. Firstly, the patient must be ventilated for greater than two days to be eligible for PBAE surveillance, um, but do note that those first two days can establish your baseline period of stability or improvement. After the patient has been ventilated for two days, then you need two more days of worsening oxygenation. So the earliest a patient could meet PBAE definition is after four days of um, mechanical ventilation. So what do we mean when we're saying um, baseline and worsening in the PBAE definition? Your baseline is going to be your greater than or equal to two calendar days of stable or decreasing daily minimum FiO2 or MAP values that immediately precede the first day of increased daily minimum MAP or FiO2. Whereas your worsening is going to be after that period, that baseline period of stability or improvement on the ventilator, the patient has at least one of the following indicators of worsening oxygenation. Um, and these are going to be either in your FiO2 or your MAP parameter. We're going to go into a little more detail on those in the next slide. So these are um, more information about those specific requirements, those thresholds to meet worsening um, and identify a PBAE. In your FIO2, again, you're going to have that baseline period of stability or improvement, and it's immediately followed by an increase in the daily minimum FIO2 that's going to be greater than or equal to 25 points over the daily minimum FIO2 of the first day in the baseline period and sustained for greater than or equal to two calendar days. Where's your MAP? Again, a baseline period of stability or improvement, and it's gonna immediately be followed by an increase in the daily minimum MAP values of greater than, greater than or equal to four centimeters of water over your daily minimum MAP of the first day in the baseline period, and then also sustained for greater than or equal to two calendar days. And we're going to look an at an example that will help uh, demonstrate this. 
So just as a reminder, um, we do have to make note of age for the MAP parameter. So in this case, in this example, um, patient is less than 30 days. Um, so just as a reminder, your MAP values of zero to eight are going to equal to eight. So you see for days two and three, that days two and three, MAP is seven, but that would consider to be eight for um, determining your daily minimum value. So the first thing we're going to do is look for that baseline period of stability or improvement. And we see that we have that established in both the map and since we have a baseline period of stability, we're then gonna look for our period of worsening oxygenation that was sustained for at least two calendar days and meets that threshold of greater than or equal to 25 points over the daily minimum FiO2 or greater than or equal to four centimeters of water over the daily minimum map of the first day in the baseline period. And we see that requirement is met in the map parameter um, on bent days four and five, we have a map of 12. So that's gonna be four centimeters of water over the first day, which is bent day two of eight. And it's gonna be sustained for at least two days. And therefore a map, or excuse me, therefore a PDAE is identified in the map parameter. So just a note here, we do have a baseline period of stability as we noted before in the FiO2 parameter on um, bent days two and three, 40 and 40. But the increase of greater than or equal to 25 points over the first day in the baseline period, which is FiO2 of 40 in this case, is not sustained for at least two days. The FiO2 drops to 50 on bent day five, and therefore um, PVAE could not be met in the FiO2 parameter. And just a note here as well, um, the PVAE definition can be met in either the FiO2 parameter or the MAP parameter, and this is um, completely independent of what is happening in the other parameter. Um, in this example, we happen to have a baseline period of stability in both of the parameters, but this isn't a requirement. Um, it can be either or, um, either FiO2 or MAP for meeting PBAE. So what if we take this same example, but let's say the patient is um, greater than or equal to 30 days. In this scenario, we would not have a PBAE identified for this patient. Remember, since they were greater than or equal to 30 days, values zero to 10 are going to be equal to 10 for the MAP parameter. So while we do again have that baseline period established on bit day two and three, the increase to 12 is only two centimeters of water over the baseline of 10. So the requirement of at least four centimeters of water over the first day in the baseline period is not met and therefore a PD is not identified or reported. However, in the same example, if the MAP values for bit days four and five are 14, a PVA would be identified in the MAP parameter since you are meeting that threshold of greater than or equal to four centimeters of water over the first day in the baseline period, going from 10 to 14, and then sustained for two calendar days. So let's talk a little bit about the date of event for PVAE. Your date of event is going to be the onset of worsening oxygenation so day one of the required two-day period of worsening oxygenation. And the earliest possible date of event is going to be event day three, since the patient has to be ventilated for at least two days to qualify to be included in PDAE surveillance, and then also meet that baseline period of stability or improvement. So in order for you to even meet a PDAE definition, they have to be on the ventilator for at least four days, um, as we've mentioned. So why is the date of event important? Your date of event is going to set your 14-day PVAE event period. Um, so similar to adult VAE, you have a 14-day grace period where you do not report a second event identified within those 14 days. So your date of event is going to be day one, and then the 14 days following that is going to give you your 14-day PVAE event period. The date of event, um, the two days before and the two days after, are also the time period during which you can assess for the antimicrobial agent and the pathogen questions that are an optional part of reporting PVAEs. And we're going to go into further detail on those once we get into the section um, of the presentation about reporting in the NHSN application. There is a reporting exception related to the date of event, um, and that's going to be if your date of event, um, which again is the date of onset worsening oxygenation, is on or after the date of documentation of evidence of consent and the patient is supported just for organ donation purposes, you would not be required to report that event as an identified PVAE. All right, so going back to our example um, that we looked at earlier, just to point out that in this example where a PVAE was identified in a patient uh, less than 30 days old, 
that our date of event is going to be the first day of worsening oxygenation, so vent day four in this example. So now let's spend some time on the PDAE data collection form and application. Where do you find the PDAE data collection forms? Um, again, as mentioned earlier in the presentation, that PDAE um, page linked here where all that information can be found. If you scroll down um, to this section where you see uh, data collection forms and instructions, that's where um, all of those items are available. And this is just the link directly to the PBAE data collection form, as well as the table of instructions, um, which is gonna give you information for um, accurate completion of the form. Just as a note, all fields with an asterisk are required. And here you can see um, a bit more of a close-up screenshot of this required information. It's going to include your patient information, a location of mechanical ventilation initiation, the date the mechanical ventilator was initiate, ventilation was initiated. Um, if the patient is a NICU patient, you would need the birth weight and the gestational age. And then, um, of course, the parameter in which the event was um, identified, your FiO2 or your MAP. So as I mentioned when talking about the date of event, antimicrobial and pathogen data can also optionally be reported for PDAE. Um, we do want to encourage, encourage you to report this. It is optional, but um, as we've discussed, PDAE is only one tier. Uh, the reason being uh, the working group did not, um, at the time of the development of the protocol, feel they had enough information to proceed with an IVAC or PFAC tier. So collecting this information um, will help us to determine if it's feasible to add these additional uh, tiers in the future. And since this is a new surveillance measure, uh, further data is only going to help us um, in uh, future decision making. So again, if you are reporting PVAE um, while these fields are optional, we do encourage you um, to report them. So when you're completing your PVAE data collection form or you're entering you know, your PVAE uh, into the NHSN application, um, you can find detailed information about each of the fields that you're gonna complete here in the table of instructions. Um, as you can see, it's five pages long. Um, it's really going to help you answer any questions you may have about uh, what the fields are asking for, um, what do they mean. Uh, chances are you'll be able to find that information uh, in the TOI. So we definitely uh, encourage you to review this. And again, this is just the same um, specific uh, criteria that you use to identify a PBAE, your FIO2 or MAP um, that we showed in the form. And this is just an example of what it looks like in the NHSN application. So for the optional fields, um, you can see here an example of what that looks like in the application as well. Um, clinical event associated with PDAE. If you select yes for this, you have um, options here. You can select all that apply. Um, and there's also an option to select for other where you can uh, free text ad additional information. Uh, similarly, for the antimicrobial agents field, if you select yes, um, the field will expand and you're gonna be able to enter three drugs. And then for the pathogens, again, if you select yes for the pathogens, optionally, you will um, have, you'll be able to complete additional information uh, related to pathogens that may have been identified. Again, for both the pathogens and the um, antimicrobial agents, that would be in that um, five day period around the date of the event, the date of the event, the two days before and the two days after. And here is just an example of um, some of these event de details for uh, these pathogen fields in the N NHSN application. This is pulled from the tables of instruction and it just provides um, you know, clarification and additional information about what those fields are requesting. A new required event um, when reporting PDAE is gonna be your COVID-19 uh, yes or no question. This is required for all events uh, starting January 1st of this year, 2020. And you're gonna answer COVID-19 is yes, if the patient is lab tests confirmed COVID-19 on the date of event, and then uh, no, if the most recent lab test prior to or on the date of event is negative. When looking at your denominator data, um, your required denominator data is going to include patient days and ventilator days for both your pediatric and neonatal um, locations. And when conducting PBAE in neonatal locations, the required denominators um, will be reported by birth weight categories can also optionally be reported by gestational age categories. And then the third um, denominator is also um, optional for reporting is going to be your episodes of mechanical ventilation. So in looking at your monthly reporting plan, um, we just wanted to point, point out here that um, in a pediatric location, 
you can see that PDAE is available uh, to be selected. And then your VAE for adults is grayed out. So only PDAE is available for um, in-plan reporting for this pediatric location. And once you've selected, um, you know, a PDA, excuse me, once you've selected to um, do PDA surveillance in a pediatric location, um, when you go to fill in your monthly summary data, you'll notice the asterisk, um, total patient days and ventilator days are required, and then episodes of mechanical ventilation is optional. Looking at the same thing, um, just in the NICU location, your monthly reporting plan, again, you can see PDAE can be selected for in-plan in reporting, and um, your adult VAE is going to be grayed out. It's not an option. And then again, when you're looking at your um, summary data for the NICU location, you're going to be required to report the patient days and then later days. Uh, those are going to be broken down, as you can see, by those birth weight categories. And then um, you have the option to report um, the gestational age breakdown as well. So our last section here, we're now going to take a look at the PBAE calculator. Again, that same page, the PBAE resource page is gonna be linked um, a bunch of times throughout the presentation, but this is where you're gonna access the calendar page. And here um, I've provided the link that's gonna take you directly to the, um, the page where the uh, PBA, PBAE calculator lives. This is just an example of what you'll see, um, or not an example, this is what you'll see when you um, arrive on the PBAE calculator page. Uh, we highly recommend that you read through the instructions. There's a lot of good information there. Um, there's so much that we had to make it expandable. So if you select that more option, you'll then see um, what is posted here on the slide, the expanded version. And again, um, we do encourage you to, to read through that information um, prior to using the calculator, or if you've been using the calculator for a while and um, you think you may just need a refresher. So when entering an event into a calculator, the first thing you're going to do is select your date of um, mechanical ventilation, your mechanical ventilation start date. And after you've done that, you see that there is a second question here, is the patient's day of life where date of birth equals day of life one, less than 30 days on the mechanical ventilation start date? And that's gonna be a yes or no question. You would select yes if the patient is less than 30 days and no if the patient is 30 days or older. And you're gonna select the next button. And you see here um, for this patient, they are less than 30 days, so we've selected yes. And then um, once you select yes, it's going to ask um, what the patient's day of life is on the mechanical ventilation start date. Um, so for this example, this patient was five days old. And you can see that these are grayed out. Um, once you get to this page where you're able to enter your daily minimum values, these items cannot be changed. Um, if you needed to change these for whatever reason, uh, you have to go back and start from the beginning. So once you arrive here at the PVAE calculator, you're gonna enter your um, daily minimum values, both for the MAP and the FIO2 parameter um, as demonstrated in the screenshot here. And once you've entered all of those, you're going to select uh, calculate PVAE. And you can see in this example, a PVAE was identified in the MAP parameter. You see that the calculator, and this is important, this is why you have to enter um, that yes or no question if, about the patient's day of life if they're um, less than 30 days old or uh, greater than or equal to 30 days old, because you can see here the calculator automatically adjusts um, any map values um, that are less than eight to be eight in this example, because the patient was less than 30 days old. So you'll remember map values that are zero to eight are all gonna be equal to eight. And you see here, we have um, a baseline period of stability and then um, worsening oxygenation that meets that threshold of um, greater than or equal to four centimeters of, centimeters of water over the first day in the baseline, in the baseline period, so a PBAE is identified. So in this scenario, you see that we've changed um, this patient's day of life. It's no longer, they are no longer um, less than 30 days. We've selected no, indicating the patient is um, 30 days um, or older. And therefore, the calculator is going to readjust so that all values that are between 0 and 10 are automatically in the MAP parameter going to be equal to 10, which means that in this case, a PBAE is not detected um, as indicated at the top of the page and underlined in purple there. And that's because um, that threshold of uh, greater than or equal to 4 centimeters of water over the first day in the baseline period is no longer met. And see, although you have a baseline period of 10 and 10, um, the next two days on um, mechanical ventilation, day three and four, 
are only 12. Um, so that does not meet that threshold of greater than or equal to four. Another cool feature of the calculator is the explain button. So after you have entered an event into the calculator and calculated whether you have a PBAE or not, it'll offer um, the option to select and expand this explain button, which will just provide more information um, as to why the calculator provided uh, the information that it did. And that concludes our presentation on pediatric ventilator associated events. Um, thank you so much for your time today. And as always, if you have any questions, please do email us at nhsn at cdc.gov. Thank you.